Warning, this project involves voltages that when handled incorrectly may pose a serious health hazard. Please make sure that you know what you're doing before attempting to replicate this. For years, I eyed the really cheap microcontroller sector. Paduk processors at $0.03 cents each were too basic and difficult to flash. Poyas, too slow and boring. But a month or two back, I heard about the CH32V003 from WCH on EEV blog. It was just right. A 48 MHz RISC-V processor with 16 kilobytes of flash, 2 kilobytes of RAM, DMA, and a lot of peripherals. And a single wire debug interface. It can even run at 5 volts like an AVR. And I'm a sucker for tiny parts, so I just had to get the QFN at 12 cents each. For other packages, like the Soik version, it can dip as low as 10 cents each. A whole dev, board, and programmer under $10 shipped. I have to admit, I'm not the first maker to be captivated by this part. Unbeknownst to me, my friend Bitlooney saw these same chips and had the same feelings and beat me to a video. You should totally check out his video after this one on the CH32V003 Supercluster. One of the first things I did was make my own dev kit with double rows so I could use each pin and also probe those pins for debugging. I also had Astronautilus do the silkscreen and art on this board. I wanted to make a fully open stack for programming and debugging. The first thing I did was make it possible to use the WCH Link E programmer that comes with the kit to be used to flash it in Windows or Linux and an open source development stack. Then I designed and ordered an ESP32 S2 programmer that could also turn on the 3.3 and 5 volt rails. I got 25 dev kit slash programmers made, and if you're one of my patrons, message me on Patreon and I'll mail you one along with one of the ESP32 S2 programmers, well, if you're in the US for free, or as cheaply as I can if you're global, stock permitting. While the CH32V003s aren't in stock on LCSC, I was able to purchase them through JLC PCB so that I could play with them and order boards without needing to hand solder anything. It's a lot of fun to be able to design these boards, order them, and get them about seven days later. Now comes the whole point of this video and the cause of the thumbnail. I saw this listing on AliExpress for Nixie tubes, and I didn't know much about them other than this was the cheapest that I had ever seen them, and they were really pretty. Spirit 532 was nice enough to talk me through everything I needed to know about how to safely drive the tubes. For instance, never overdrive the current, and avoid turning on multiple cathodes. And it looks a lot better to use full current, but PWM the Nixie to dim it. In addition, a great way to drive it with relative safety on a noisy supply is to use an 18 kilo ohm anode resistor. I recently noticed this itty bitty 2.5 by 3.2 millimeter flyback transformer on LCSC, and I was dying to merge these projects together. So I spent an hour or two where I designed and ordered these boards. They use a 12 cent CH32V003 as a closed loop software controlled flyback controller with a 3 cent FET this itty bitty 30 cent transformer, one cent diode and two cent smoothing capacitor to produce the 180 volts at 2.5 milliamps or so needed to power the Nixie tubes, all for under about 50 cents in parts. The 003 has enough I.O. to take input from the host, do closed loop control of the FETs, and individually control all of the segment's cathodes, and have an extra cathode left over for just some additional neon bulbs. I started using CH32V003 Fun, my open source SDK, as the basis for this project. Since starting it, a lot of people have created some really great examples. The idea of this SDK is, instead of using complicated libraries that use lots of code space performance and memory, CH32V003 Fun gives programmers an easy way of writing code to do what they want without all of the complicated modules and components, exposing the complexity that HALs try to cover up and letting us jettison those unneeded, hidden, complex parts, and increasing the effective power of this chip by three or fourfold. All I did was import CH32V003 Fun as a submodule alongside new folder, and then I went to town. I started by copying code from my blink test to verify that the part was okay. Then I copy and pasted some of the other examples people wrote, like EMEBs, timer, and ADC samples. I configured my I.O. and started writing. One of the first things that I knew that I would want is some sort of GUI, so I used RawDraw and MiniCHLink, the open source programming toolchain that we wrote for CH32V003Fun, as a library so that I could communicate with the data 0 and 1 registers over that single wire programming debug interface. That way, I could quickly and easily program the device and over the same wire control my target voltage while monitoring the feedback voltage to make sure that things didn't get too spicy. 
And just to be safe, when I first started, I wanted to always make sure that the tube was turned on so that the current would have somewhere to go instead of letting the voltage rail rise crazy high. I actually did use one sacrificial unit to see how high the voltage could get, and I was worried it might arc over or explode. I had to disable both the current and voltage limiting safeties. The voltage just went up to around 400 volts, twice that of the rated values for the transformer and capacitor, and it just kind of cooked itself. The flyback works kind of like a boost converter, except that because there's a 10 to 1 ratio on my transformer, it gives me 10 times the voltage over the boost voltage on the input, on the output. I turn on the main switching FET, and when I do, the current begins to flow through the primary side of the transformer, charging it like an inductor. The longer the FET remains on, the more energy that gets stored inside the transformer. Then, when I release the FET, all of that current has to go somewhere. The primary isn't connected to anything, so the current flows through the secondary, into this fast switching diode, and charges the capacitor on the high voltage side. I was able to use the TRGO system so that I could let timer 1, the PWM that the FET was on, to trigger an ADC conversion. If you're using a microcontroller as a switch mode power supply, you really have to synchronize the ADC to your switch because if you sample at random times, you're not going to be able to accurately control the output because you won't be able to measure it. It'll just have too much noise. But if you sample at exactly the same time every frame relative to the switch, then all of that noise disappears. Speaking of noise, because we are literally a flyback converter, the values from the ADC are going to be a little bit noisy even with that trick. But here's another neat trick you can do use to filter signals in code. We use an IIR, an infinite impulse response filter. That means that it doesn't average over a specific window, but it does care about more recent samples than older samples. Normally it's done with an equation that looks like this, and it's very complicated, but because our timing is at least approximately constant, we can make this a constant. And furthermore, we can, with some bit shifting hacks, turn this into three instructions that doesn't require any multiplies or floating point. It takes several charge and flyback cycles for the voltage of our output capacitor to get up to the operating voltage. And as we approach the target voltage, we can actually roll off on the power because we're using a PID, or proportional integral and derivative control loop, to control the high voltage rail. Additionally, we can use the incoming voltage to properly tune the maximum time that the FED is allowed to be on to prevent transformer oversaturation. This, however, does take a multiply. It's the only one in all of the code. This matters because this core is only an RV32EC core, so no multiply instruction at all. Instead, we have to do it in software. So I was able to heavily optimize the multiply for this chip to be around 30% faster than the LiveGCC software multiply. And one of the other things I thought was fun is that you can actually see on the scope the length of time spent in the interrupt, and depending on the values that you're putting into the multiply, it takes less or more time. With the flyback done, I did want to light up individual segments, but Spirit raved about the ability to dim segments, so I added that. And boy was he right. These tubes look so pretty when you're fading between digits. I did this trick where I split up the PWM into multiple stages so that the primary switch rate is very high, greater than 1.5 kHz to avoid flicker, but we can also get a lot of intensity resolution over a longer period of time. So now I have the single chip solution for controlling a high voltage flyback that can tune to any voltage I want, as well as being able to handle the dimming of some of these tubes. It can talk over that single wire debug bus that can be communicated to with the single file header that can run on pretty much any microcontroller, and all of this with a bomb price of less than 250, PCB included, for the control board. What's next? Well, since we aren't weighing ourselves down with a hardware abstraction layer, this project only uses about one-eighth the amount of flash and RAM that the chip has, and a bunch of extra CPU cycles are free. So there's lots of room for new features. Maybe I can use UART, or if I'm lucky, maybe emulate WS2812's, let's call them neon pixels, if you will. I'm definitely going to control these with an ESP32S2 so that I can control them over USB, or maybe I'll just turn into a really pretty clock. I've intensely commented my code and put it up on GitHub. Check it, ch32v003fun, and my Patreon link out in the description. I'm also going to be testing another rev of these boards. In fact, they're already on order. Also, I might have a deep dive into this code. Anyway, thanks for watching.